The idea of gunboat diplomacy has changed into what we might now call carrier diplomacy. This is because of changes in military technology and geopolitical tactics. This strategy, which comes from the older practice of showing off naval power to persuade or threaten other countries, has been especially useful for the U.S. as it deals with its rising competition with China. With China's assertive actions in mind, the planned deployment of five U.S. aircraft carriers to the Western Pacific is a modern example of this principle being used to show that the U.S. is still committed to keeping a strong presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Gunboat diplomacy was first used in the late 1800s to describe showing off military power to get people to work together or to achieve foreign policy goals with the help of big naval shows. Seeing a warship or group of ships was supposed to have a big effect. Despite the Cold War, gunboat diplomacy continued, mostly because the U.S. Navy had so much nautical power. As U.S. Secretary of State, the late Henry Kissinger summed up the idea by saying, an aircraft carrier is 100,000 tons of diplomacy. While the U.S. and China are becoming more and more competing as great powers, the U.S. could use its carriers in a 21st century version of gunboat diplomacy. Or maybe it should be called carrier diplomacy, since it was announced earlier this year that at least five U.S. carriers could be sent to the Western Pacific this year. With that show of military power, nearly half of the U.S. Navy's 11 nuclear-powered supercarriers, Beijing will be reminded that it's not the only country in the Indo-Pacific region showing off its power. But it's important to know that the five carriers won't be lined up like the Royal Navy warships were in the famous film from the Battle of the Atlantic in WHOT. Two of the carriers, the USS Carl Vinson, CVN-70, and USS Theodore Roosevelt, CVN-71, had been in the Philippine Sea with Japan for a military drill, while the USS Ronald Reagan, CVN-76, was in port at Yokosuka, as reported by responsible statecraft in February. Recently, the USS Abraham Lincoln, CVN-72, left San Diego. In the next few weeks, the USS George Washington, CVN-73, will take over for CVN-76. As a result, the U.S. Navy is demonstrating its ability to consistently keep a carrier presence in the area. Although China may want to build a fourth carrier, it would be hard for them to do what the U.S. Navy can do, which is send multiple aircraft carriers to any part of the world. According to earlier reports, however, the recent deployments of its ships around the world have made the U.S. Navi very busy. For the duration of the current Israel-Hamas war, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower CVN-69 stayed in the Middle East to protect ships in the Red Sea, and the USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 was sent to the Mediterranean twice more. The world's first supercarrier has since returned to the United States, where she will spend part of the year getting upgrades to her many systems. Additionally, the USS John C. Stennis, CVN-74, is currently going through her planned refueling and complicated overhaul, which began in 2019 and will not be finished until 2025. Later, the ship will have to go through sea trials before it can go back into service. Therefore, the U.S. Navy can send more than half of its ships to the Indo-Pacific, but it can't send them anywhere else.
there is always at least one nuclear-powered ship going through an RCOH, and others are getting repair after being deployed. There are still a lot of U.S. flat tops in the Indo-Pacific, and China has been in a territory dispute with U.S. allies like Japan and the Philippines for years along the so-called First Island Chain. According to a study released in May 2022 by the U.S. Department of Defense, China has engaged in gunboat diplomacy in the South China Sea for 10 years, pressuring its maritime neighbors to accept its territorial claims of indisputable sovereignty and control over 90% of the sea. As a result, China's maritime bullying has become more expensive. America's relationships with Southeast Asian countries have gotten stronger because of Beijing's aggressive actions. To be continues. There is no denying that China is also seeking to flex its naval muscles. Yet as responsible statecraft warned, while these U.S. Navy carrier deployments are presumably intended to signal American resolve and commitment to its regional allies, they could easily encourage China and North Korea to engage in their own reciprocal demonstrations of strength. These also a reminder that the U.S. approach to East Asia is still very much a military-first approach that gives short shrift and devotes relatively few resources to economic statecraft and diplomacy.